We are going to take a look at Brooks Law. This is a statement contained in The Mythical Man Month, which was an essay written by the computer architect Fred Brooks and first published in 1975. One key thing the essay explores is what can happen to productivity in a software project when additional staff are brought in in an attempt to complete the project sooner. Brooks Law states simply that adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. It is sometimes used as a kind of universal mantra to justify many things, but as we'll see it's important that we understand the underlying reasoning before applying it. Let's consider a real project and see how this might work out. In this project Nain Systems are building a major new version of their trading product to be called System 2. The new system will be sold to financial services companies. Competitor analysis has confirmed that this will be the only system of its type. Mike is assigned project manager for System 2. And Jane is to be technical lead in the project. Joe is a financial trader with many years experience and he takes on the role of domain expert in the project. Joe happens to know Jane from a previous project. And at the end of the first week Pete, an experienced developer, becomes free from another project and is able to start working on System 2. He takes over development of the pricing module and is able to make good progress because he developed the code for an earlier pricing module. As would be expected, Mike, Jane, Joe and Pete all spend a bit of time each day communicating with each other. Maybe finding things out. Or resolving problems. or communicating progress. And a fly on the wall would observe that most days part of the time available for each day was used up in communication. After a few weeks Mike, the project manager, holds a planning meeting with stakeholders. They look at the deadline and the current rate of progress and it's clear, with the current headcount, they would be delivering quite a long time after their ideal deadline. So, people are recruited externally. Inevitably, the new staff don't have the same depth of background as Jane and Pete, and as it happens the tasks they work on are less independent. The new developers are competent enough, but they do need to ask questions and get help from time to time. And this takes up progressively more of everyone's time. Leaving them a bit less time, of course, to work on their own development. However, after a few weeks with a team of six developers, the project is still moving along noticeably faster than it was with just Jane and Pete developing. But then, with six months work left on the plan, there's some worrying news. A competitor firm announces a new trading system that has many of the important features of System 2. An urgent meeting is called and all agree that to give System 2 the best chance of success in the marketplace everything possible needs to be done to deliver it sooner. The stakeholders decide that the way forward is to recruit 10 more developers on the team to bring the deadlines in. But things don't really work out as well as they had hoped. First the team stand-up is obviously slower than it was before just because there are so many people to get round. But there are bigger issues afoot. 
the new team members all need to find their feet before they can become productive. They are assigned mentors to help them get up and running and answer questions. Existing team members are tasked with improving the developer guides. Unfortunately, the increase in communication doesn't die off even when the new members get established. Those developers whose code integrates with other people's communicate a lot. And when ideas get misunderstood, the result is a bug that soaks up more time. The team experts get asked more questions and their own work slows considerably. Code is implemented but sometimes breaks and often requires the help of the experienced developers to sort things out, especially over integration problems with the legacy systems. And the new developers can be unproductive for several hours at a time when problems arise and the other team members are too busy at that point to help. In the end, with 16 developers, the project takes slightly longer than was originally envisaged when there were just six. Although things seem to be going fine with six people on development, adding an extra 10 moved the team size beyond a critical point at which each additional person contributes a net loss to product project productivity. The project taking longer is what would have been predicted by Brooks Law. Adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. But those who just know the statement of Brooks Law can draw invalid conclusions. Typical misunderstandings are of the form, big teams are usually slower than small teams, or if I get another two contractors to work on our project, then the project will be later. Generalizations like this simply aren't valid. We must understand the reasoning behind Brooks Law, as explained in Chapter 2 of the book, The Mythical Man Month. The problem is that when new members enter a team, they need to pick up the knowledge that the others already have, and that soaks up time. In effect, all the extra communication is at risk of providing a net drain on team resource over the time period that the project had available. However, the rationale behind Brooks Law actually tells us how we can improve things in our projects generally. The problem is often in the communication, but there's no getting round the fact that the people who need help must involve those who can help. However, there's nothing stopping us trying to optimise that. Although it is inevitable that there is a point beyond which additional staff become a net drain, what we'd ideally like to do is move this point to the right, so that we can add some more people and hit an earlier deadline. The team can be more productive by doing two things, a combination of reducing the amount of communication and making the communication faster. Here are some examples of how we might reduce the amount of communication. First, when seeking to add new people to a high profile project, we could try as far as possible to staff the project with personnel who already have an excellent understanding of the overall task at hand and will add relatively little to the communication overhead. We could also try as far as possible to optimise the communication so that things only need to be said once. Taking a little bit of extra care so that people always use the same phrases to describe the same things would be an inexpensive measure to reduce misunderstandings. We can also ensure that, as far as possible, we organise the workload so that tasks are independent and can be worked on alone. The idea of high cohesion can help here. If we design our systems so that components have a set of related responsibilities that you would expect to be carried out by a single component, then we can attain high cohesion. 
with components that don't interact unnecessarily and won't involve developers in extra communication when developing them. We can write code that is self-documenting using a programming best practice that is basically about effective communication. And finally, when making choices about a new technology or process, we could add the additional question, what will be the impact on the team's communication overhead? Making communication faster when it does take place can often involve careful consideration of the tools and processes used. So we can work at providing communication mechanisms that are quicker to use get the ideas across faster and don't in themselves result in extra work. The overall result of all of these things is that the communication overhead on the whole team can be drastically reduced. So in conclusion the statement of Brooks Law itself is okay to use for general direction but the real benefits come from understanding why Brooks found this to be true.